So here's how it's going to go. And it, this is going to be a team effort. So I'm going to ask Paul and I'm going to ask Bill to answer questions in the chat room if they come up. So I'm not going to stop to answer questions. So no need to raise your hand, put them in the chat room or into the parking lot. Uh, there are a few spots in my presentation where I'll be taking two questions after each section. Uh, the whole idea is to listen to the feedback that we got, uh, that people want more lecture, less questions that divert. Also, this presentation is very granular. Uh, this is in response to a lot of the students who feel that they are left behind. They don't understand all the technicals and they're a little bit shy and embarrassed about asking some super basic questions. So if some of this material is very fundamental, just sit back, enjoy your popcorn. And there is some trivia in here. So I think everyone is going to be learning something. Uh, I actually learned some really interesting curiosities about nonces because they baffled me. You're going to know everything about a nonce. So all that mystery will go and away. Michael, will, are they going to give them a test at the end, ask them three most important questions? Well, since you just said that, yes, Bill, that's going to happen. <laughs> okay. okay, so we're going to be talking about Bitcoin, how it works on a granular level, as well as industry use cases in global trade and supply chain. So we're going to start with the tough one first, which is how Bitcoin actually works on the blockchain. It is a digital currency. And records are just simply kept on a digital ledger. Account balances are not maintained, just a digital ledger. We have Dave with, he's got his 12 and a half, Alice 323. So copies of the ledger are simply stored around the world. And the unique thing about it is that the database is decentralized. It's not a one place. It's one of the rare things that people have a hard time wrapping their head around that the ledger is not in one place, but it's in multiple places at one time. So how do you send money? Uh, Alice just simply goes on her computer and sends five Bitcoin to Bob. Uh, that seems simple, but let's get into the complexity of how that actually works. So the first thing that we start with is a digital signature. A digital signature is simply a series of numbers and letters. We use it only once. It's going to be unique and it's going to prove your ownership that you own your wallet, which has your Bitcoin, but you're not disclosing everything about your wallet. All it discloses is that you are the actual owner without giving away your privacy. It's like saying, yes, I have an account at Bank of America, but I'm not gonna tell you what my PIN is. So to create a digital signature, there are two types of keys. We have the private key, which is basically your password. That's the really good key. And then you have the public key, which is the one that acts as a signature that the entire public can take a look at. That's where they send the money to. It's kind of like a, an escrow account or a Dropbox. So again, the private keys are your true password. And by the way, I will be repeating myself two or three times if it's something that you really need to know. So private keys are gonna be your true password. That's the one that you really protect and keep secret. And then the signature, your public key, is going to prove to the public that you own that private key, but we're not going to be revealing your password or your identity. So the public key is where people are going to send you money to. It's basically the equivalent of your wiring instructions. It acts like a deposit box for the public to use, and it basically looks just like this. So now, once you're on the network, the network can verify through that digital signature that the public can see that yes, you actually own that account, that is you, but we don't know everything about you, therefore we can't steal your money. So now every transaction is gonna get a digital signature, but it can't be used again. So for example, you see that Alice has sent money to Bob, Dave, Juan, and Bob, and her digital signature is different every time. This helps her with her anonymity so people can't track what she's doing. Now, if anyone tries to get wise and change the original transaction, such as change the signature, the, the public key to their own public key, then it's going to invalidate the transaction because it's going to change it. Now, the math is relatively complicated. If you want to Google elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, uh, have at it. Also, also mathematical trapdoor will give you some more information on that. 
So once you do an order, it's going to be broadcast to the nodes. These are your Bitcoin miners or your bookkeepers. And the computers in the Bitcoin network are going to create a record of the transaction. So here, Alice is sending out to the world. I'm sending from A to B, five Bitcoin, and everyone is putting it on the ledger. Now, previous input transactions are looked at to verify that you have the money to send that you're trying to. They don't look at account balances. So for example, Alice is trying to send to Bob five Bitcoin. So they look back to where Alice received five Bitcoin. So here she received two, and in this transaction she received three. Three plus two is five, so yes, she has enough money. This is how they do it by going back through the transaction ledger. And go to the next slide. So this is some of the technicals of what it looks like. So we're gonna start with the output that this person is trying to send 139 Bitcoin. They have to prove that they have it. So they're referencing all these back transactions which add up to uh, more than what they need. Now, you can't split these transactions up so she is proving that she has 139.616. She's only trying to send 139.606. So actually the change gets sent back, okay? So the output is the dollars that you are sending to someone and then you also get change sent back to yourself. So here's how the transaction chain is gonna look like on the blockchain. Alice is sending money to Bob, but Alice got that money from Fred. Fred got it from Juan, and Fred also got some money from Jane. So you're just basically going back. This is another way on blockchain.info to take a look at the transactions. Now, here is a security check that the Bitcoin wallet software is gonna download all the transactions ever made. It can take uh, over 24 hours to do that because now I think there's like 20 million transactions. It's a massive number. Then we come into one of the famous problems, uh, which is called the double spend. And there are two mechanisms to protect uh, Bitcoin from the double spend. And that's basically taking the same money and spending it twice, effectively to cheat people. So how it works is you're only allowed to spend the money once. Uh, you can kind of look at it as a bounce check. Let's say I have $100, I write a check uh, for 100 bucks to Paul, I do 100 bucks to Bill, and then I do 100 bucks to Kevin Ellis. Each got a $100 check, I've only got $100 in the account. The first one to cash the check gets paid, the other two people, they don't get paid. So one out of the three is gonna get paid. And this is pretty much how it's gonna be working, that. Alice is sending money to Bob, so that's gonna, that works, it gets used. But then the money that Alice is trying to send to Jen doesn't work, and what she's trying to send to Steve doesn't work because she already spent it. So it's just like a bounce check. Now, here are the mechanisms. Uh, another security mechanism is that we check that the inputs that she got, so remember Alice is trying to send five Bitcoin to Bob, we want to make sure that she has that money. So yeah, she got, she got two Bitcoin from, this, from Fred. Then she got three Bitcoin from Charles for five. They verify that those inputs weren't spent already. So when they look to see that she got the money in, they make sure that it hasn't gone out yet so that there's enough left for Bob. And again, they're not looking at account balances. They're looking at an index of unspent transactions. So it's a huge amount of work. Now, all the transactions are transparent. So you can see that Alice sent money to Bob, June sent money to Dave, and so we can take a look at this. Now, it, it is encrypted, and that's actually a good thing. For example, I use Venmo, and I have a friend who had led me to believe that he was rather wealthy. Well, on Venmo, it shows everyone's transactions. Why, I don't know, but it happened to say that my friend got some money from this person and the reference to it was it was money for the roommate expense. So I thought, well, why do you have roommates if you have so much money? So that was a reason why that anonymity is important because people like me find out things that you probably don't want me to know about you. Now, again, about the security hole of the transaction order on the double spend. It doesn't matter if you sent that, it doesn't matter when you send the money, it matters when it gets verified by the miners. 
So for example, let's say that I send money first, five Bitcoin to somebody, and then I send the same five Bitcoin to a second person. Now comes this race that the first money I sent could go through the transaction process slowly. The second one could go faster. If it gets confirmed, this is very similar to me giving a check on Monday to Bill Wellman, and he walks slowly to the bank to cash the check. And I give a second check to Kevin Ellis on Tuesday, and Kevin runs to the bank and he cashes it before Bill does. And that's how the double spend can work by playing around with the speed. Now, again, orders are not received in the same order that they were sent. It's very important. Next, we don't use timestamps because they can be faked. Now, let's take a look at this one. So Alice is going to be sending five Bitcoin to Bob for a product. And then she's going to be sending five Bitcoin back to herself. Okay. And this is where you're sending money out to Bob. Bob wants to ship the product, but then Alice is sending the money back to herself. So she's hoping that this transaction gets posted first after Bob sends the product, then Bob basically has the equivalent of a bounce check on his hands. So effectively what Alice is trying to do is race to get her transaction sent back to herself before Bob can get posted. And I'll show you how we're going to prevent that from happening. So again, if Alice gets her transaction posted first, then Bob is going to be out of luck. So now we come into the double spend solution. How do we stop this from happening? The nodes come into play where they have to agree on the transaction order. So for example, here are our blocks that we've all seen before. That block 65 is chained to block 64. Block 66 is chained to 65 before it. And this is where we start to get our time stamping mechanism of what happened in what order. The blockchain will have two components in it. One is these Bitcoin miners can take a look on the transaction chain to see the history of ownership. This is basically making sure that Alice has enough money to send these Bitcoins to people. The blockchain is going to be ordering the transactions. So the transaction chain is going to be looking at, do you have the money? And the blockchain is going to be confirming, when do we confirm that, yes, this money got sent and it's yours? So again, the chain and the referencing is what is going to be creating the timestamp for us. So notice here that in block 67, there are multiple transactions. All these transactions within the block are considered to have happened at the same time. They're considered to be simultaneous. Now, this is where we have our double spend issue. It comes when you have unconfirmed or unordered transactions. They're basically hanging out, waiting to get confirmed by the miners. Now, the miners get their name because they're basically, quote unquote, mining for gold. If they can get their transaction block approved, then they get a reward of Bitcoin. That's how they make their money. What they're also doing, besides making money for themselves, is that they're really providing bookkeeping services and they're tellers because, remember, there's no government or bank intermediary to do the bookkeeping and the Bitcoin miners are doing this as a service, and this is how they get paid. Now, here comes the question, what happens if two miners or two bookkeepers want to post the same transaction? So here's the existing blockchain. This one just happened. This is the block right before it and the block right before it. Here's a new block. So Jack just did his bookkeeping. He wants to post his transactions. Frank wants to do the same thing at the same time. So how do you decide who is going to win? Keep in mind that trades can arrive in a different order than what they were sent. This is going to be important further in the presentation. They do a race. They basically race to see whose block is going to get posted. And this is where all the energy consumption comes in. And I'll show you that in our next slide. They're basically racing to solve a three-part math problem. And now we're going to detail how all three of these math problems work together. So basically what they're doing is they're guessing a random number 
called a nonce. So the nonce is a number between one and a little over, or a lot over, uh, four billion. And it's one of the three math problems that they're trying to solve. They're really not solving a math problem. They're just basically guessing a number. And they get a more expensive, bigger, faster, souped up computer to figure out faster than you what that number is. And they just keep checking. Is it this number? Is it that number? Is it this number? And that's where all the electricity is being used. The next one they do is they, they're going to be looking at the transactions in the previous block. We're going to dig down into that. But basically, I want to dig into the nonce right now that it's just guessing a number. It's not really solving a math problem. Now, a nonce is actually an abbreviation. It stands for number used once. And I beat my head on the wall for a few days trying to figure out what's a nonce, why do they call it a nonce, what is it all about, and finally I figured out it's just a number used once. It could also be a word that is only used once. This is part of the security that they use that you're only gonna be using this number once. Next is the second part is that you're gonna be creating what's called a hash. A hash is a unique fingerprint of the block of the transactions. And the hash is quite interesting how it works. It is a fixed length series of numbers and letters. You can kind of think of it like a serial number. Now, Bitcoin uses what's called the HA256 hash function. That means the kind of serial number. And the HA256 hash is basically a string of 64 numbers and or letters long. It's 32 bytes. And the hash is created using an algorithm that you get from the software program when you're a miner. Now, the algorithm is going to convert a group of numbers and letters including the unconfirmed Bitcoin transactions that are pending into an encrypted output of a fixed length. That's the 64. So again, this hash is going to create a unique serial number or fingerprint. It doesn't match the original data. Now you could take a book and you could hash a book into its own little serial number. You could also hash a poem, which is much shorter. You're still going to get a hash that is the same length. So you have no idea how long or short the data is that is in the hash. There are five unique properties to the hash. The first one is rather interesting. It's deterministic, meaning the same information is going to result in the same hash. So let's say that Bill and I have the same book, War and Peace, let's say. When Bill hashes War and Peace, and I hash War and Peace with my computer, we're going to get the exact same hash. It is literally a unique fingerprint. It's very fast to calculate it is the second property. The third property is that you can't decode backwards what is in War and Peace by looking at the hash. You can't figure it out. Now, a small change to the data itself, even changing a period, is going to wildly change the hash. And two different messages cannot create the same hash value. So it is literally unique. Now, here's an interesting security enhancement. It's the fixed length output. So anyone who's trying to, to decrypt the hash can't figure out how long or short the input is. So let's say that we have two hashes, and we say, okay, pick which one is a hash of War and Peace, super long book, and which is a hash of a haiku, which is a really short Japanese poem. The hash won't be able to tell you because it's the same length. So you don't get any clues from that. Now, here's another security enhancement, is that the hash will completely change if you have a small modification. So this is the hash of the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. This is the hash. Now, what if we add a period to the sentence? The hash changes a lot. You can't figure out that this hash was even close to that hash. And that's where you're going to be getting some security function. You could have a hashing program and type in the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and you're going to get this number. Okay. Now, back to the three-part math problem. So you have to hash, you know, put into the algorithm what the previous block was, which that's going to be available to you, the current transactions that you're trying to hash, that's what you've been collecting, and then this is where the fun comes in. You just start guessing this random number. Now, 
the software will tell you that whatever your hash is, this number that kicks out, needs to be below a certain number. And if you're not below that number, you have to go back again and try a different random number and then a different random number. And this is where all the time and energy and computer usage comes into. It's trying to figure out the nonce to make sure that your hash, including that nonce, that's your unknown, needs to be below a certain target number which is provided to you. So how do you win? Again, the hash has to below a target number. It has to be below a certain number. If you can't figure it out or you're too high, you have to just keep on going. So how hard is it? The computers that we're logging in with tonight for class, it'll take you a few years to do one block. By that time, uh, it's all over. Uh, all the computers in the world that are dedicated to Bitcoin mining, uh, it's gonna take about 10 minutes. The interesting thing about uh, Bitcoin is that it is going to adjust. It's always adjusting the difficulty of the figuring out the nonce so that you always come up with 10 minutes. So Bill was talking about uh, the Chinese are not having the Bitcoin mining going on, so there's gonna be less miners. They're gonna make that nonce easier to figure out so that they can stay within the 10 minute processing time. But it's still very hard to do. So let's say that you win. Uh, so this person in West Africa won, and they're gonna broadcast their proof of work, meaning, hey, I got it. Uh, to the network, and the network is going to add Jack to the blockchain and say, hey, you won. Excellent. So that sounds really good. However, oh, also, you get paid. You basically get Bitcoins based on whether or not you can solve the block, and that's the incentive for doing this. So basically, the more computers you have, the more Bitcoin you're going to get. If you unite with other people in consortiums and partnerships, then collectively it's kind of like going in uh, on an office pool to uh, win the lottery, but you're gonna have to split the winnings. Now, you can have a simultaneous winner. Uh, it is very rare. Here's the probability distribution. It's, it's gonna be hard to have a simultaneous winner, but it's possible. So what do you do if you have two winners? Well, let's take a look at this one. Let's make it really complicated. Let's say that we have three winners. So here's the confirmed blockchain. We have a green winner, a blue winner, and a pink winner. So they're gonna be creating multiple branches off the blockchain, and this is temporary, but it's gonna happen. So you're gonna have three branches on the blockchain. So now take a look at this. Let's say that miner Carol, she won, and she gets a pink block. Uh, let's say that I got lucky and I won, but I was in partnership with Bill. We united our computers together with Paul. So the three of us, we got the green block. So good for us. And then Jonelle, she got the blue block. So now what these people are going to be doing is that everyone can start building. You just basically, as a miner, will build on the most recent block that you're notified. So some people will say, okay, I got the green, I got the blue, others got the pink. Watch how it is resolved. You basically start working on the most recent block that you got, and different people have different ones. The tie is broken when the next person creates a long block. So take a look at this gold person. They won the next block, and they attached it to the blue block. Okay? So now, what happens with the pink person? and the green person. Actually, the green person is me, Bill, and Paul. So the longest chain just became the gold block. Well, now, Bill and Paul and I were kind of out in the cold, and Carol's a little bit out in the cold. Watch how that gets resolved. This is called end of chain security. Our transaction, we have a bunch of transactions which are now in what I'm calling an abandoned block. So we're just kind of left. We were confirmed, now we're unconfirmed. So we basically go back into a chain in security. We go back into the pending bin. So now we're back in the cloud, waiting to get reconfirmed again. So the order that we thought went through just got reversed and now we're back into unconfirmed status. So this is where another double spend attack can occur because now we have insecurity. We don't really know where we are. So a short abandoned block if you were in one of these, you could be vulnerable to a double spend attack. So let's walk through this one. Let's say that Arthur is gonna to try to do a double spend attack. Let's walk it through. So Arthur 
is going to pay Bob, A, Arthur, is going to pay Bob, B, with the intent to defraud. Arthur wants to send some money to Bob to get Bob to ship some product, but then Arthur secretly wants to take that same money and send it back to himself, and his goal is to make himself the longest chain. So he's trying to make chain 2A, the long one, and he's trying to throw Bob into the abandoned block two. So watch what happens. So again, he's trying to defraud. He, his, his goal is to make a replacement transaction which sends the money back to himself. Keep in mind, it's really hard to do this. You're racing against the world, but this is how you're gonna do it. So again, Arthur has made himself a longer chain. However, can you actually do that? Can you really succeed with this? Let's take a look. So now Arthur has already spent the money going back to himself. He's trying to put it into the longer chain. Again, only the first one in the chain will be valid. So he's trying to invalidate the money to Bob, make a super fast chain that's longer and send the money back to himself. That's what he's trying to do. So he's really racing literally against the world. If he's successful, he will invalidate Bob's money. He gets that product shipped for free and he gets a refund on his own money. So this is a lot of work for a free box of something. So again, he can't pre-create a longer chain, which is what he would need to do. You can't pre-create it because you don't know what those pending transactions are going to be. So really the, the short answer is it's really hard to do. You really can't do it in reality. However, what if you could? Is there any possible way? So even though you can't pre-create the blocks, you have to race like everyone else. So is it possible to actually be faster than the world? What is required for you to make that longer chain to send that money back to yourself? Can you edit the blocks? Could you just simply commit fraud? Well, remember that once you change, you're gonna to have to start changing the hashes. You're gonna change the information, which is gonna change the hash. But remember part of your hash includes the hash of the confirmed block before it. Once you change one thing, you're going to break the chain. And that's where the security comes in. You change one little thing in that block and you're going to break the chain. Everyone's going to see it. You're going to see something happen and the Merkle tree is going to light up and show you exactly where that was. So again, what if you try to edit the posted block? Your hash will change. The previous transaction won't match and people will know that you can't win and you can't post it. So that, that angle is not gonna work. Well, what if we took the angle that we're just gonna get a whole bunch more computers? So I'm gonna say to Bill, hey, get some more friends. Paul, bring in some more friends and let's get a whole ton of computers. Let's say that we did that, that we get Jeff to play along, we get Kevin Ellis to play along, Ferris is gonna come in, Francisco is gonna stick his computer in. What happens now? You still need over 50% of the global computing power to have a greater than 50% chance of winning. So again, you just don't have the computer power to do it. And all the money, time, and effort that you spend, is it really worth that box of whatever you're trying to steal from Bob? So it really comes down to, can you even do it? And even if you could, is it really gonna be worth whatever you're stealing? Now, let's talk more about security. Older transactions are more secure because it's so hard to change stuff in the past. You do have vulnerability if you're on a fresh block. For example, I got hired to do a blockchain project for some people in China. They paid me in Ethereum this morning, and I got a note that said that they are not going to consider that money posted on my account until 50 blocks have been posted past my block. So they're really making sure that the money is, is going to be definitely secure. Uh, but again, that slows down the whole thing. Like that money's not really mine. It came in at five o'clock in the morning. That's going to be 50 blocks times 10 minutes. So I have to wait 500 minutes before I can really call that money mine. Meanwhile, FYI, Ethereum has dropped 8% since five o'clock this morning. So <laughs> I'm, I'm already discounting my services. That's for another subject. So this basically all shows this is why you don't need to trust the person on the other side, because there are so many security measures involved in this. Now, your proof of work is going to be massive. You have to do 
this massive number of giga hashes just to solve it. Again, this is where we're going to be getting into all that energy usage. So to try to just be a Bitcoin miner on your own with one little laptop isn't going to work anymore. It's really becoming a much bigger, it's an industry at this point. Also, be very careful that there is no 800 number, that if you screw something up, the money could go wrong. Again, I ran into it today. The people in China said to me, what is your public key? So I went onto my software, I copy pasted the QR code and the key, pasted it into the email and sent it to them. But what if I had clicked into that key and changed the number by mistake? Well, that money would have gone somewhere else. They would have said, well, we sent it to wherever you told us to send it to. I didn't get it. We don't know who did get it. They can't pull it back. They're probably feeling that I should still do my work because they did their end of the deal. And so this is where some of the anonymity on the receiving end can get really sketchy. I can't call anyone up and say, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't even call the person who got that money and say, hey, could you send it back? So you, there, there is a very unforgiving system. You can also do some complex transactions where you can have uh, more than one person who has to sign off on uh, whether this money is going to be sent out in a signature, in a signature, so it doesn't have to be uh, just one person. So you can have an, have an added layer of security there. Also, which is rather interesting, is Bitcoin is deflationary because it is a limited supply, and there are lost private keys out of there. And I'm thinking that this may be a larger problem than people think, because I know at least five people, friends directly or friends of friends, who have lost their Bitcoin because their laptop failed, they, they lost the USB stick. So if I know five people in the world, there's probably uh, a lot less than 21 million Bitcoins out there, but I don't know. Now, let's talk about anonymity. Uh, you, can be, you can change your level of anonymity on Bitcoin. Uh, you could use the Tor network, which is gonna hide your IP address. I'll show you where you can inadvertently let people know a little bit about who you are and what you're doing. Uh, if you use the same public key, people can start to link your transactions. So it's encouraged if you want anonymity to change your public key every time you do a transaction. Now also, if you take a look at these inputs from earlier in the presentation, this person was trying to show that they had enough inputs to send this money to this person. Well, all these digital signatures are different, but you know that they belong to the same person. So that's one way that people can inadvertently see that you're using multiple digital signatures because you batch them together in the input section to prove that you had the money. Uh, your wallet software can generate new public keys for you. So you can utilize that. There are more possible key addresses than grains of sand on the earth. So rest assured that it's probably gonna be unique. Uh, also, every two weeks, the difficulty of the nonce number, the random number that we're guessing, is going to be calibrated every two weeks so that it gets closer to that 10 minutes. So if less miners are out there, like in China, uh, they might recalibrate it. And then if those miners move to uh, Switzerland or the United States or wherever they go, uh, Canada perhaps because it's colder with cheaper electricity as well, then that number is going to get adjusted over the two weeks. 80% of the Bitcoins have already been mined. So there's about 17 million out there. Uh, we have a few more to go. The last one's gonna be mined in 2140. So what is the incentive after all the Bitcoins have been mined? Uh, it's gonna be go to transaction fees. And don't worry if you can't afford one Bitcoin or one Litecoin, you can do a one, one millionth, which is called a Satoshi. So that is the smallest unit of exchange. So you could actually buy Bitcoin, you know, $5 worth of Bitcoin. You'll have quite a few zeros after that decimal though. Uh, future miners are going to be compensated with transaction fees most likely. Uh, the jury is out because this is such a fast moving technology. Uh, also, you may have to change your transaction fees. The higher transaction fee that you give to someone, to a miner, is going to let you jump the line. So if you want your money to get put into a block quicker, uh, you could play around with your transaction fee. And if, you don't, if you're trying to do it for free with no transaction fees, uh, there will not be an incentive for a miner to post your transaction. So uh, this may not be a free game at the end of the day. 
Uh, so in summary, uh, your digital signatures are going to safeguard your money and your anonymity. The transaction chains are going to show uh, who owns who owns what to make sure that there's actually good funds being transmitted, and the blockchain is going to maintain the transaction order. Uh, your cryptographic hash, that's what protects the blockchain to make sure that that information is correct. Uh, then you get your benefits from Bitcoin. Uh, the government cannot print money or manipulate the currency. The governments aren't a part of it. You have your anonymity and you have global, global transaction costs. And on challenges, it is difficult to exchange. And I think someone has their mic on. If you could check that the uh, mute yourself. So it's difficult to exchange uh, Bitcoin. It's not easy. For example, the place where I was using Bitcoin, uh, the bank let me buy it and then they just dis discontinued the relationship about two months ago. So now I can't sell it. I have to find a different bank. So it's not really easy to do this. Uh, also, Bitcoin has been used for legal activity. For example, if there's malware, someone's taking over your computer, it's great for kidnappers. Uh, there was a guy in, I think, the Ukraine. He was a, a Bitcoin miner and they knew he had a lot of money. And so they took him hostage and he had to pay his own ransom with Bitcoin. Uh, also, mining is just using a ton of energy. I believe right now we're using about the equivalent of three or four nuclear generators. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a total waste of energy. You're not really getting much out of it. It's all to be guessing this number. So it's a bit silly on one level, but it, it does fit the goal of what they're trying to do. And now before I move into supply chain, I can take two quick questions that are relevant. So Michael, Sergio's had his question up. So Sergio, why don't you go ahead? Thanks. Uh, so in terms of the nonce, um, I think back to the, the Enigma device in World War II, it wasn't so much cracking the code, it was basically getting a hold of the device to figure out how the code uh, worked, right? So if the platform is open source, and there was something that was obviously designed by programmers, who's to say that someone couldn't get a hold of, like, let's say, for, you know, the analogy of getting hold of the Enigma, Enigma device, to then just guess the nonce so that they constantly kind of capitalize in that respect of constantly winning that position on the block. I agree with you. That's the same thought popped in my head. And I'm going to ask Paul uh, to answer that in the chat room because I think he's going to be better qualified than myself. And I just want to grab uh, two more quick questions. Uh, Benedict, I saw your hand up. Yeah, the question was uh, regarding double spend, right? Mm -hmm. So if you post those two transactions in one block, the logic that you walk through is not longer valid, right? And in my opinion, if you post them within the 10 minutes that the block is created, they will always be in the same block. So I wonder how you kind of avoid that. Uh, you can't post those two transactions in the same block because... You, you have to look at the inputs. So let's say, okay, I have five inputs to give to Benedict. So in transaction one, I spend it to give to you. But when I try to do the second transaction, the double spend back to myself, the balance isn't there. So I can't put it in the same block. Yeah, right. Okay. Does that makes sense? Okay. Yep. <laughs> I got him. Got one right. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Josh. Let's do one extra super quick. Uh, mine's probably pretty quick, but there's a lot of use of the word they here, which always makes me nervous. And so I assume we're talking about those who are writing the algorithm, those who are writing the software to begin with, the, the node holders, what have you. But what is deciding the original correct nonce? I think it's a great question. And Bill actually knows some of the people who are doing the Bitcoin programming. And I'm going to ask Bill to answer that in the chat room so that I can pop through the rest of my presentation. Bill, it's that okay that I toss that one to you? Yep, that's fine. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving. All right. So now let's take a look at blockchain for supply chain. By the way, it gets really easy now. Supply chain and blockchain is much similar. So if your eyes were crossed and your brain was twisted, it's going to get uh, some relief over the supply chain because this is really easy to grasp. So let's start with the food industry. Walmart is actually for real doing a blockchain safety solution in food with IBM. So Walmart and IBM are coming together. 
let's take a look at the problem that blockchain is solving. Remember with your papers and your projects that you need blockchain to actually be useful, to do something meaningful. It's not this nice to have. We want you to be using blockchain as a need to have. So let's take a look at a problem that we had in 06. There was a spinach outbreak in the United States that resulted in three deaths and we had 199 cases. It took forever to figure this out. Just to give you a sense of the problem of the scope, 600 million people a year get sick from food contamination, 420,000 die. That's a massive number throughout the world. So back to our spinach outbreak in the United States. This is Frank Giannis. He's VP of Food Safety at Walmart. So he's working directly with IBM to get this figured out. And this girl actually got sick from the E. coli, uh, from the spinach. She didn't die, but she had to go on dialysis. So it ends up being that there's really a face to people who are being impacted on a lack of food safety. And the problem with the current system that we have is the speed and lack thereof. It took two weeks to discover the source of the spinach outbreak. And take a look at this. They found out that the spinach came from one supplier. It was one lot and it occurred on one day. That was it. It was a very small isolated incident. But for two weeks, virtually all the spinach in the United States was pulled off the shelves. And in that two week period, three people died. Half the United States were impacted and 200 people got sick. So this is what blockchain is trying to solve. Can we find this tainted food faster? Another example, uh, some of you may remember this. This one was relatively recent, it's just a few years old. The Peanut Corporation of America was supplying only 2% of the US's uh, peanut paste consumption, one supplier. However, they were in 3,900 products because peanut is used as a binder and a filler. So it's in dog food and it's in food bars, it's in crackers, it's all over the place. And Basically, you had a lot of innocent people that had clean product that was pulled off the shelves. To give you a, a pure example, when I owned a food company, I knew that Trader Joe's, if you have a food recalled in Trader Joe's, they kick you out and you never come back. So they had three peanut butter suppliers at Trader Joe's. They were all fired. They were never permitted back and none of them had tainted peanut butter at Trader Joe's. So people were hurt economically even though they didn't do anything wrong. So being, taking a long time to figure out where's the bad food actually has a massive impact on a lot of people over and above the people that are actually uh, physically ill from the, attack, from the um, contamination. This is one dessert. In total, 41,000 food miles were logged to bring this food to market, which means there were 41,000 mile opportunities for this food to go above the temperature it was supposed to be at, for a truck to break down and something gets spoiled. You have tons of opportunities for this food to go bad. It's almost a miracle that it lands on your plate clean to begin with. So again, back to Walmart working with IBM, this is what they've come up with. Taking a look at the food chain, you've got your customer, you've got the farm in the equation, you have the packing house, uh, all the transportation modules, uh, crossing borders, then you've got your pickers, then you have the warehouse, then you actually have the final product at Walmart, and then someone's actually handling that as well. So this is also how the information is not put together and blockchain brings it together. Let's say that you have party D. This is someone who's in a deli. Here's someone that is in an office building. Here is the bank. Here's an auditor. Here is a distributor. Here is a shipper. None of these people are talking to each other. So let's say that we have some tainted food product and we say to the guy, oh, there's some bad spinach that was on your truck. Oh, it wasn't bad for me. It came from the guy who was shipping it. And oh, well, no, actually it came from this factory. So a lot of finger pointing happens, but you really don't know where the source is because no one's talking to each other and no one can see each other's records. So the traceability is really dropped out because you have so many players in the game, but no one is looking at each other's records together. And this is where blockchain is a, a wonderful solution for a supply chain. So here's some things that we can look at 
The one that we just talked about is that we can trace where a food is coming from, what happened, where, and when. But we also get an added benefit of using blockchain, which is transparency. We can start answering the questions of, hey, is that food really fair trade or did you just stick a fair trade sticker on the mango? Was it ethically sourced? Oh, I see uh, your food is coming from a country that uses child labor. How do I know that a kid wasn't actually there? Well, if I know what farm that, that it came from, maybe I can figure that out. Is it really vegan? Is it really non-GMO? Is it really organic? Or did someone just stick it in an organic box and, and double the price on me? So you can get a lot of traceability and transparency by using this. The food safety is gonna be increased because you increase the speed at which you find out where your food came from. For example, it took a little over two minutes to trace where these mangoes came from. So just by doing the, clicking on the barcode with this program, this handheld device in Walmart store, it's found that it came from this mango farm. And it only took two minutes to go through the data. And we can thank basically IBM for leading this. They're using the Hyperledger project. And so they're uniting in one central location the records of the farmer's records, the processor's records, the distributors, and the retailers. We can also keep in records such as, is the temperature still good? Has it been contaminated? Has anything been compromised? So before I move on to global shipping, I can take, uh, oh, Kirtana, very fast with the hand raise. Go ahead, Kirtana. Um, so question on the data piece of it, um, the data is probably only as good as the person who uh, inputs the data, right? Yeah. So how is that managed? Like I can say, um, I could be the farm owner and I could say this is organic, but it's not. So where, where's the, the trust, I guess, the trust part of it with that? Well, basically, if you're going to, since I was in the food business, I actually know the answer. It's a bit of a strange answer. If you're going to be certified organic, basically your entire operation is going to be certified organic by the government. And you have an absolute ton of records that you have to do uh, to prove to the government that it is organic. And if you, if you do something that's not organic, you lose your certification, you get fines, lots of bad things happen happen. What they would do with that certified organic transaction is all the records that these farmers have to keep are going to be put on the blockchain so you can take a look at them. And if those records have been falsified, and let's say it isn't organic, then using the blockchain, you can say, hey, I happen to know that that farm really isn't organic, or they actually fake their records. Using the blockchain, you can trace it back that the records were actually falsified, or you can verify, oh, this farm actually has been certified organic and the government has been working with them for quite some time. So basically, the records that you're gonna be getting that you have to do for the government to say that you are organic uh, can just get put on the blockchain. So, Go ahead, Bill. So Michael, let me, let me use a different example. Let me, let me talk about diamonds, okay? Yes. So that, blood diamonds. You know, blood diamonds are illegally mined and then they make their way into the diamond supply chain. So what uh, Leanne Kemp has done is she puts all the diamonds in the supply chain or in the, on the blockchain. And so she knows the mine they're coming from and they've created a machine where they can, the machine looks at the diamond and then it takes 35 attributes of the diamond and it uploads it to blockchain. In addition to that, they engrave on the edge of the diamond a micro serial number. So you can't see it as the as it, with human eye, but the machine can. So now you have coming out of the mine, right? You take those diamonds, you upload their characteristics, and you up and and you put the serial number on the diamond. Okay, then they flow through the supply chain. Well, what was happening is along that supply chain, diamond smugglers, if you would, were injecting new diamonds into the supply chain. However, they did that, right? Now each diamond can be individually verified and validated as being uh, a, an authentic diamond from an authentic mine, right? Because, and you've got a serial number and you've got 35 attributes. So, um, so that, that's a different example, right? You're not certifying that the diamond mine is organic, as you said, Michael, in the farming case, but you are capturing the diamonds from a, valid, from a mine that's doing uh, uh, legal mining and then you're tagging them, and then they make their way uh, through the supply chain, and 
because of the combination of, you know, of the attributes and the in, engraving on the diamond, you know, you know, you can be, you can be assured that that diamond has not been, is not a blood diamond, but came from a legitimate source. And so every, every situation, ha every uh, supply, every object has to be, uh, you have to figure out how to do this, right? But that's an example of how they're doing it with a diamond. Go ahead, Michael. And another thing that you can do, uh, so let's, so we, we talked about the organic food and we talked about the diamonds. To go back to a food example, uh, let's say that we're talking about frozen product, that it has to be shelf, it has to be temperature controlled. Uh, there are trucks that have temperature gauges that will be pinging out, like in a text message, what the temperature is, let's say every 10 minutes. Now, you cannot go in and manipulate that temperature gauge. And in reality, you're looking at truck drivers that don't really care. They don't have any interest in trying to, to mess with that data and change the data. The most they can do is smash it and break it. And then that's going to go on the blockchain that, hey, uh, the, re the recording of the temperature stopped. So now I may not, through my smart contract, feel obligated to pay for this ice cream if I think that, you know, it thawed out and then got refrozen. Now it's no good because the temperature uh, gauge wasn't pinging every 10 minutes. So that could be something where it's just like an automatic and no one's going to be manipulating it. And there might be people who can't change it, they can't manipulate it, or they don't really care about it, like the truck driver of the, the frozen ice cream truck. That, does that help? Okay, Graham, yep. last question. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hi, um, so, um, quick question. When we're talking about Bitcoin, when someone submits an, um, a block, it's verified by the network and they're able to look at the keys and whether or not the money has been double spent to, to basically verify uh, um, whether or not this is a valid submission. On a private blockchain, such as the, the food supply one that, that, that you mentioned, how, if at all, are they able to verify a submission from a participant on the network? Um, is it just yeah. through consensus through 51% of the, of the, or is there some sort of person who judges whether or not these submissions are accurate, or is it just they're working within a trusted network? Uh, I'm going to be answering that in the rest of the presentation, which is going to get into permission network. So I'm going to be taking okay. care of that. And so let's keep on moving and uh, we're almost at the end here. So now let's talk about cross-border supply chain, streamlining the global trade. Again, IBM is, really has their, their hands dug into this one. And take a, let's take a look at our example that the paper trail on using shipper containers really hasn't changed, that everyone has their own records. The country that has manufactured a product, they have their own records. The, country that is receiving the product in, they have their own records. And anytime you're crossing a different border, they have their own records. No one is sharing it. And this is actually a big deal because 90% of global trade is on ships. So Maersk is actually a client of IBM trying to put this on the blockchain. Now, this is a shocking statistic that the paper trail to track your shipment costs twice as much as shipping whatever you're shipping. So if it costs you a dollar to ship a shipping container, it's costing you $2 just to make sure that all the paperwork is in order. So it's a massive waste. And what you're gonna find is that blockchain might not help you make money, but it can help you save money, which is going to make money on the bottom line. So what we're starting with, and this gets a little bit into what Graham was talking about, is what's called a permissioned blockchain, which means it's a blockchain, but only certain trusted people are allowed to be a part of it. So for example, if I'm shipping some flowers from Africa to Rotterdam, Bill doesn't need to be a part of that blockchain. I don't need to be a part of that blockchain. But the person who grew those flowers and the person who's buying those flowers and the shipping container that is shipping them, they need to know what's going on. So this, is, this project is part of the Hyperledger project. Uh, Hyperledger is part of the Linux Foundation uh, one of my friends is the chief of staff at Linux. She was one of the videos that you're going to be assigned to watch. Um, Hyperledger is a project. It is a, basically, it's a branded 
blockchain. IBM is one of the several partners in the Hyperledger project working with other companies. They basically spend, I think, about a quarter million a year to be a part of it. And Hyperledger is using smart contracts, which does the self-execution. We're actually going to watch one work. So to understand what Hyperledger is, it's basically part of blockchain. So there's the Hyperledger project, which is an umbrella over three specific blockchain programs. There's Hyperledger Fabric, Aroha, and Sawtooth Lake. So it's an open source blockchain that is using smart contracts. This is an important quote. Hyperledger is a project. You don't build stuff on Hyperledger. You can build stuff on Hyperledger fabric, but not Hyperledger. For example, I didn't make these slides on Microsoft. I made them on Microsoft PowerPoint. So you can think of it that way. So again, the basically thing that the basic advantage that blockchain can have in shipping is that it's going to streamline everything. They can now track millions of containers a year and they can make sure that things are tamper proof. And if they have been tampered with, they can show that too. So let's take a look at shipping with Maersk, one container of flowers from Africa to Rotterdam. There were 200 pieces of communication to ship one container. So that's packing lists, that's customs forms, applications, and now we're gonna show how IBM has put this onto the blockchain. So people in the permissioned blockchain, that permission to look at this blockchain is the Bank of Kenya, the financiers, the Kenyan growers of the flowers, the export authorities in Kenya, there's several of them, the Port of Mombasa, the Port of Rotterdam, which is the receiver, Rotterdam Customs, that's going to make sure that, that flowers are coming in and not drugs, the Dutch market that's actually buying it, and then the Bank of Holland, who is the financer. Uh, these are forms that have to get filled out, and this is the smart contract that you're going to start to see moving around. So, all these people that have the red arrows have permission to be on the blockchain because it's, they have an interest in it and it's in their best interest that they're looking at accurate data. So let's start with what's going to happen. Step one is that a packing list is going to get put onto the blockchain. That's, that's going to come, be coming from the Kenyan growers. That automatically is going to go down to the three agencies that need to verify that everything is in order in this packing list. So there are three government agencies that need to check this. Within that, there are six forms that need to be filled out before it actually leaves the country. These are the six forms. So you have to do the invoice, the packing list, export license. So all that has to get filled out and it gets recorded when it has been green lighted. And anyone that is in the chain can see where are things hanging up. So if my shipment's late, I can say, oh, the export authorities are, are stuck on the certificate of origin. So you can see where things are happening. Now, once you get these forms filled out, then the smart contract gets put onto the blockchain. And here are the steps of the smart contract. So the first thing it says is that we need a signature required from the KRA agency that this is good to get onto the boat. So that is gonna green light the contract and that could also release perhaps an escrow payment or a deposit that says to the flower, the flower growers, okay, I'm getting 10% of my money because I just verified that I grew the flowers and they've been verified not by me, but by an agency that, yeah, there's a container full of flowers and someone just said, yeah, there's a bunch of flowers there. So you can start to pay me some money. So your first deposit could come at that green light. Now, this is very similar to your Amazon tracking that you can see where something has left Kenya, uh, where it is in the warehouse, and watch the dates and times of where things are going. You can see what kind of container that you're in, the empty container showed up, uh, then we filled it up. So everyone can track it. Everything is gonna be documented step by step. So you have your timestamps, and then you can take a look at where everything is going and who the interested parties are. And again, it's just all granular detail. You can just follow this thing step by step by step. And your basic advantage is, is that it's, it's tamper proof. You can reduce any delays in fraud and you can save billions of dollars annually. And the big question is how much can you actually save? And according to the World Trade Organization, you can increase global GDP by 5% because you can ship more product because you can streamline the process. 
and total trade volume can go up by 15%. So imagine all the products that have been stopped at the border because they didn't fill out the paperwork right. I, when I was in the food business, I had stuff coming from Finland and we always got stuff stopped by the FDA. And it always came out because, oh, the paperwork wasn't right. Well, with the blockchain, we could have said, hey, don't bother putting that frozen stuff on the plane because you don't have your paperwork right. The FDA could have stopped it before that product was sent, shipped, and then turned back. And I can't tell you how much stuff I have that was quarantined by the FDA because when it came into the country, the paperwork wasn't right. So that's the end of the presentation. Do we have two questions? I see Graham's hand is still up. Is that an old hand up or that, that's a new hand up? No, that's, that's an old hand, sorry about that. Okay, and Sergio, we heard from before. Can we get a new hand if there's any questions? Otherwise we can, so I'll take Brittany and then I want to take those 10 minutes for Bill's exercise. So Brittany, one minute, what's up? Okay, hi, I'm just curious if the smart contract um, is offered in multiple languages. Well, the thing is, a uh, smart contract is basically taking a regular contract. Uh, okay. I want to give Brittany $5,000 to you know, sell me her BMW or whatever. So it's just a regular right. contract. It's converted into uh, computer code. And everything is if-then statements. If Michael wires Brittany $5,000 in U.S. dollars to this bank account by February 25th, then Michael will get the title to Brittany's uh, BMW that is in whatever town that you're living in. Uh, so it's basically programmed in computer code. And I would say Paul can give you probably more details on different languages, but the short answer would be yes. The long answer is I don't know exactly how you do that, but I would say, yeah, it's going into a computer code. Okay. And I see other hands are up. Could you please put them in the chat room or the parking lot? Because I want to give Bill his 10 minutes for your exercise. And I'm done. Bill, back to you. Okay, Michael, thank you.